He usually pops out in a moment. You know, I didn't realize, is that a raven? It is a raven, yeah. Great, so we'll talk for a moment about black raven. Anyway, um, as I said just a minute ago, but we were on camera, um, please welcome Anne and congratulate her on publishing today, in the no, tomorrow, in the United States, but we're kind of coming up early, on her wonderful new book, The Raging Storm. So round of applause again, everybody. All right. And as you noticed, her publisher produced a really lovely little map of Devon, which is in your book um, and which will help ground you. Because I think, Anne, we could safely say that you're at least the three series currently running, Shetland and Vera and um, The Long Call, are really anchored by landscape, aren't they? Absolutely. I think I always start off with a place. I find place before I understand who the characters are or what the story is. Because I think that we are a product of where we grew up, the friends that we played with, the streets where we played, the community that we're a part of, all feeds in and makes us who we are. So to understand the character, I need to know those things. I need to know where they've come from. My daughter's an academic. She's a human geographer looking at the individual within their community and within their landscape. And I think really that's what I like doing best is exploring the idea of community and landscape. And really, some of the stories can only have come from specific places, so it feeds into plot as well as into character. So. Sorry, usually I wing it, but I thought that I should do that today. So in 1986, and began a series with George Palmer Jones, amazingly a bird watcher. How does that play into your life in Norfolk? Yeah, I, my husband was a passionate bird watcher. We first met on the island of Fair Isle, which is one of the most remote of the Shetland Islands. Shetland's a long way from anywhere. It's 14 hours by ferry up to Shetland mainland and then three hours, almost probably the most horrible boat in the universe to get to Fair Isle. And it's a, I, it's my kind of spiritual home, I suppose, for I love it there. Um, so I dropped out of university, needed a job, chance meeting in a pub in London, got me the job as assistant cook in the Bird Observatory in Fair Isle. Couldn't cook, knew nothing about birds, but off I went to go. And while I was there cooking, um, my husband turned up as a visiting bird watcher. It's, a, it's where they study bird migration, seabirds, and do lots of ringing. But he turned up, for a, and then he came back the next year and stayed a bit longer. And we got married. And our first real home was on the island of Hilbury, another island, which is a tiny island in the Dee estuary. It's tidal, so you can walk there at low water across the mud and the, and the rock and the tide. But then when the tide comes in, it's a real island. We were the only people living there. Um, it's tiny. Um, and Tim was the warden. We had no mains electricity, no mains water, collected water from the roof, had, had tilly lamps and an open fire. And it was lovely. But if you're not into birds, and I'm really not, <laughs> then it's a bit boring. Mm -hmm. So that was where I started writing. And obviously, I was in the first series because I'd always loved golden age fiction. You know, the, the 1930s, 40s, 50s fiction of Christie and Dorothy Sayers and Marjorie Allingham. That's what I thought detective fiction was. I thought you had to have a, a very wealthy amateur sleuth who fell over bodies in strange places. So my detective was called George Palmer Jones. He was a retired civil servant, naturalist. <laughs> Sorry. And he fell over bodies in nature reserves. And the first book is called A Bird in the Hand. In the UK, it's been reprinted with a lovely jacket. Um, and they call it classic cleaves. <laughs> It's not that good, but <laughs> um, but yeah, in the first book, I kill off a bird watcher, <laughs> which saved my marriage. So briefly diverting from birds, when I was reading a bit of your biography, my understanding was that you were not so much smitten with Tim for his handsome features as for the bottle of 
whiskey or whatever it was in his yeah. baggage. <laughs> well, Fair Isle was a fairly dry island at the time. And, um, you know, part of my job as assistant cook was to show the birders to their dormitories. And I did notice tucked at the bottom, at the top of his rucksack, was a bottle of very good malt whiskey. This is a guy worth getting to know, I thought. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we, uh, we did get married and we, lit, we had wonderful adventures for more than 40 years until he, he died very unexpectedly five years ago. So. Second series, started in 1990, figured in Inspector Ramsey in Northumbria. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember ever reading one. Oh, well, some of them are all right. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we moved with, by this time we had two children. Tim was working for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which is our major conservation charity in the UK. And he was working as a conservation officer in North East England. So was born in the South, grew up in the South, both of us, moved to the North East to a former pit village called Hollywell, which is lovely. And suddenly it occurred to me that if I wanted to write that sort of traditional murder mystery, village murder mystery, that the place, the best place to set it was North East England. Because in the South, most of the pretty villages, despite what you see on Midsummer Murder, are taken over by wealthy incomers. So there is very little sense of community. But where I'd moved, people really did peer out of net curtains and knew absolutely what was going on. You know, if I, my kids, I could send them very happily out to play because the little old lady over the road would be keeping an eye on them and would, mm. would be able to tell me where they were when I wanted to find them. So, um, yeah, so that's, I started writing a, a police procedural, my first police procedural uh, featuring Stephen Ramsey. And, um, yeah, so that's, I, I, writing about these small communities. Northumberland, if you've watched Vera on the television, is beautiful. It's the patch between the Scottish border in the north, the River Tyne to the south, the Pennines to the west and the North Sea to the east. So it's a beautifully defined region. And it's got those beautiful uplands, the moorlands and the beaches and the castles that we've, we've seen on the show. But it also has pockets of quite interesting post-industrial landscape because, you know, coals from Newcastle, we used to have coal mines, we used to have pits, we used to build ships. And we don't do any of that anymore. So there are pockets of real deprivation. But that made it so interesting for me as a writer because I could write about all those different communities. And I think the, the variety of the place means that I can carry on writing about Vera because I've got lots of things still to say about the place and the, uh, the, place and the, and the people who live there. So Vera is the longest running series that um, Anna's been writing. But now, now I'm speaking of Vera, the third series, first book in 1999 with, with Vera. And I think that one was actually in the North Pennines, wasn't it? I mean, you're in this area, but was the first book set up there? Uh, the Vera book, yes, yeah, so, so, but set up, it set in, in the Northumberland National Park. I had a very new, trendy editor. At this point, I wasn't doing terribly well. You know, I was... They talk, there is a euphemism in publishing which talks of the mid list. That means you're bottom of the heap, you know, <laughs> you're nowhere near the mid. And I was definitely in the mid list. But so I had this new editor and um, she decided that she wasn't going to commission any traditional mysteries anymore. What she wanted was big standalone psychological suspense because that's what she reckoned was selling for her. I would have written whatever she wanted, you know. I just wanted to be published at that point and to carry on being published. So I had this idea for three women doing an environmental survey up in the Northumberland Country Park before uh, the, the creation of a big quarry. And um, there, would be a, there would be a murder, you know. I wasn't straying that far from the genre. I was still going to mm. kill somebody off. But it wasn't supposed to have a detective in it. But I never plot the books, and about a third of the way through, I got really stuck with the story. And 
Um, it was your wonderful Raymond Chandler who said, if you're stuck with a story, have a guy burst through a door with a gun. Mm. And if you read Raymond Chandler, he does that a lot. He must get stuck quite often. He must have got stuck quite often. Mm. I don't really do guns because it takes too much research. And we don't actually have that many guns in the UK. Okay. So I don't, don't do guns. But, um, but I thought it was a good... It might be a good exercise, a useful exercise. So I was writing um, a, a scene in a, a funeral scene in a small church in the hills. And I had the door burst open. And one of those miraculous moments that sometimes happen when you're writing, in came Vera, fully formed. <laughs> and I described her as looking more like a bag lady than a detective. <laughs> She's carrying all her notes in a supermarket carrier bag, plastic carrier bag. She's wearing sandals and has mucky feet. And that's how Vera... I had her name right from the start. So that's where Vera started. And when, um, when the TV show was commissioned and Brenda Blethyn agreed to do it, they, she, she's a great one for going back to the source material. So she's read all the books everything even there's one book that has never been adapted and she's read that and keeps pushing well i think we ought to do this one day i think we should yeah. do this <laughs> which is lovely um and she was so funny she said yeah they gave me this i read this book and i thought but i'm supposed to be the star i only come in halfway through <laughs> <laughs> which of course she doesn't in the show so that's, yeah, that's how Vera started, just by chance. And it was it was just going to be a standalone novel. And then um, the trendy young editor married a music journalist and moved to Australia. Hooray! Mm. <laughs> so I could write a series. <laughs> well, keeping on trend, we are now in 2006, and now we're in Shetland, and now we have Jimmy Perez. And Raven Black, the first one, won what I will call a Gold Dagger Award because I'm old, but it's actually now called the Duncan Lowry. But basically, the Gun Duncan Lowry Dagger, it is the British Crime Writer Association's um, best novel yeah, award. Yeah, but I was so lucky, Barbara. Why were you lucky? Because Duncan Lowry is a private bank and they sponsored it for three years. So it meant it had prize money. It hasn't had. Exciting. It had, didn't have prize money before, and it hasn't had prize money since. But it paid me enough that I could give up the day job. Right, because if you win the diamond dagger from Cartier, they take it back. <laughs> they <laughs> they do. show up with it for the ceremony, and then, as I remember, if you're a woman, you get an earrings or something, and if you're a man, you get a nice little lapel. Yeah, pin. and I was unlucky there because Cartier stopped um, sponsoring oh. it the year before I got the diamond dagger, so I didn't get anything. Well, actually, what you really got was a really cracking good TV series, right? <laughs> um, and I'm looking over here at um, at the Raven. So I love that. Um, I ended up really wonderful. Um, she was a guest of honor at this convention I was telling you about, and she had a wonderful um, hour interview, which I am cribbing from shamelessly, but why not? Um, and I really loved the way you talked about the inspiration for Raven Black. So would you tell us what that was? Yeah, sure. So um, we were at this point, we were living in Northumberland, uh, but we'd met in Shetland and we'd been back several times, but I'd never really been back in the winter. As I've explained, my husband was a very passionate bird watcher what I think in the UK you call a lister. So he wanted to try and see as many birds in the UK as he could. A very rare bird turned up in Shetland between Christmas and New Year. And I hadn't given him a terribly exciting Christmas present. So my Christmas present to him was that we would day trip Shetland to see this bird. Absolutely crazy. Had to drive up to Aberdeen, which is, I don't know, five or six hours drive get onto the ferry, 14 hours north on the ferry. It's winter. So it's it's dark in Shetland. Shetland lies on the same line of latitude as uh, bits of Greenland and Alaska. It's a long way north. So it doesn't get light till about 10 in the morning. Tim is very keen. So he set up his telescope looking out of Clickamin Loch in Lerwick, waiting for this bird to appear. I had more sense. I went and got the all day breakfast in the local supermarket. <laughs> came back luckily the bird was still there 
Can you imagine going all that way if it had flown off overnight? Hmm. It was um, it was an American coot. It's quite similar to a British coot. Yeah. But it was absolutely delighted to see it. Mm -hmm. But it was the nicest day. It had snowed, which isn't that usual in Shetland, and then frozen on top of the snow. And it was really still. And usually it's windy in Shetland, but it was completely still. And I saw ravens just like that. And they play. They do, they do sky dancing. And they actually, like, toboggan down the hills they slide down the hills they're, they're just amazing uh, creatures but because i'm a crime writer i was watching them and thought well if there was blood as well <laughs> and that and just the, the idea of those colors the white snow the black raven and the made made me think of you know it was quite mythic like a fairy story like snow white or sleeping beauty and that stuck in my head but I wasn't sure that I, that was enough to start a novel, but it, it wouldn't go away. I thought, oh, I'll turn it into a short story. But, but then six weeks later, later, I just happened to be back in Shetland because at this point I was um, still having to have a day job and my day job was helping train library staff. So I was going up to Shetland to do, do a bit of training for the library staff there and got talking to uh, the literature officer and said, oh, I've got this idea for a book, but it would be impertinent, wouldn't it, to write a book about Shetland when I, I don't live there anymore. And he said, go for it. I'll introduce you to a, to a cop. So he introduced me to the former cop in Shetland. We were sat there. And I said, so if there were a murder in Shetland, would you investigate? Or would it be, would somebody come in from outside? Oh, well, we'd have to have the serious crime squad in from Inverness. And so they'd charter a plane and they'd come in. No, no, they wouldn't have a budget to charter a plane. They'd come in on a scheduled flight. So the, the, the company that was running the planes at the time was called Flybee, known to locals as Maybe. <laughs> Because you know there, there were always technical problems or weather problems. I said, but what if the plane didn't get in? What would you do? Well, we'd cover the body with a bit of tarpaulin and we'd wait. And just that sort of tiny detail brings a story to life, I think. So yeah, I went ahead and, and wrote it, and I suppose that was the career changer for me. After after twenty years of writing, I could give up the day job. Right. Thanks to Duncan Laurie. So it's, it's really, you know, good to remember that not everybody writes a, you know, becomes a literally an overnight success. It's a 20 year overnight success. And the other thing I think is that many, many of the best writers have had varied jobs or varied phases in their lives. I think I think about my friend Ian Rankin, whom I truly love and has a very interesting back career before he actually began to write the Rebus books. He actually wrote two or three not very good books as John Harvey. Um, and anyway, but of, of all the things on his resume, my absolute favorite, because he's the only person I know who could say this, he was a swine herd in France. I mean, but you know, I think it yeah. lends texture to the books. <laughs> he lived in a hippie commune in France and, some, and, and the mother of one of my feral friends was actually in the same oh, commune. Really? Yeah. I love it, right. So, um, yeah. So Small progressing world. now that we are, um, we're now up to the final series, but who knows if she has more. Uh, and this is the Two Rivers series set in Devon with Matthew Venn, which is the book we're here to talk about. But before we do that, I know that you're all dying to hear hot gossip about the TV series. And Anne will yeah. tell you, but I also wanted to tell you, and I want to ask her that first. When I was in Shetland, which I got to the easy way on a cruise ship, um, which went to the Faroe Islands, so I didn't have any idea how hard it was to get to Shetland. You know, it's like, you know, it's Tuesday, we're in Shetland kind of a thing. Um, you know, you think about Shetland ponies, and there's a beautiful art center in Lurik, and we drove. But what I didn't was not prepared for was there is an active silversmithing operation. And so this is my... I'll walk around so you can see it. My Shetland pin, which I wore today for Anne. But what I wanted to ask you was, what is the symbolism of the dragon? I'm not sure. 
It seems a bit Celtic to me, that. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, it will be Viking, of course. I think because, it's a Viking Because one. the Vikings also believed in dragons. So, yeah, it's, it's a Viking symbol, I think. I love it. It's so good. And Shetland Noir, I really, really wanted to go last June. And, Rob, here's the thing. If you live in Phoenix, the, the flight, a flight to Auckland, New Zealand, is exactly the same time as a flight from Phoenix to London. Everybody says, no, New Zealand so far. I'm going, no, <laughs> it's the same as London. But anyway, we looked into it, and it was going to take us 21 hours we, to get from here, and that was only if the ferries were running and nothing yeah. terrible, you know, happened. And so we gave, it was for a weekend, so we gave up because <laughs> we recognized that we would be in transit well, the entire Bar weekend. Barbara, there we're hoping to do another Shetland Noir um, in three years' time. So June, tw June twenty sixth. Yeah, I'll book a cruise. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to be book a cruise, or you, you can fly to, and it's only an hour and a half in the yep. plane from. Um, Edinburgh right. or Aberdeen, but um, yeah, Matthew Venn, that Wait, case. no, we were to go hot gossip, go back oh, to hot the hot gossip. gossip Television hot gossip. Yes, so if you've watched the Vera series for a while, you'll know that Vera's sidekick at the moment is called Kenny Doughty. Um, he plays Aiden, the character Aiden, that's, that's the, Kenny's the, the actor. And he's, he's left the show. But I'll explain why in a bit. Shetland is still filming again, and it started, um, it's just finished filming. Fil yeah, finished filming this summer. And it's different because Dougie Henshaw has left. So it's got a new female inspector who's called Ruth Calder. And Ruth, the, the fiction is that Ruth worked in the uh, Metropolitan Police. She's a Shetlander, but she moved to London. A, a case brings her back to Shetland and um, she doesn't really want to be there. And we'll find out more about that in later episodes. Um, and she's played by Ashley Jensen, who you might know from, I think, Ugly Betty here in the States, but also Agatha Raisin and other other things and she I think it's going to work really well I was there at the read through and I thought but the reason that Kenny Doughty the actor has stopped playing um in, in Vera is that he's deeply in love and he's deeply in love with Ashley Jensen <laughs> who's playing in Shetland so two ang um, I sort of ang cleaves bringing them together in a strange <laughs> sort of way but you might be interested to know that Vera is still filming. I think they finish filming on the 15th of this month. And Ash, um, Aidan has been replaced by Joe Ashworth. So David Leon, who plays Joe Ashworth, is back in the new series. So that's the latest gossip, which I don't... I mean, we all keep this to ourselves, won't we? This is a... <laughs> She told 1,700 people in California, <laughs> so I felt we could do this. But um, what I do remember with Shetland is that Tosh will, be, uh, sorry, will still be there. Tosh Sandy is, will still be Tosh there. Tosh is still there. And there's a bit of a tricky relationship at first between Tosh and Ruth because there's this other woman muscling in, and she was great friends with Jimmy Perez. But I think they'll work it out. And I, I get a kind of Cagney and Lacey vibe going on, which might be quite fun, I think, with the, the older career inspector and Tosh, who's now got the kids and the, and the bloke and, and all that. And Sandy, yes, yeah, Sandy's still there. And Sandy is played by Stephen Robertson, who is really a Shetlander. So if you want the authentic accent, it's Sandy's accent. And he... He's been in, he was actually in one of the episodes of Vera. You might have seen him in one of the episodes. He's a great actor. But he and his family have moved back to Shetland. So um, the last time I saw him was in uh, the main street, known as the street in, in Lerwick. So, yeah. So I think that's the latest goss on the telly. You know, think about the magic of this. These are entirely, you know, imaginary people. And now, thanks to television mm -hmm. and actors, they become real. And, you know, um, I love conversations we have where you all talk about the characters and books as though you knew them. But in this case, you probably actually do, um, <laughs> you know, or at least the interpretation of it. And now, now we come to um, Devin. Yeah. So, Anne, 
I know it's a personal story. You might not want to go into it. But why did you decide to to go back to Devon? Because you've been in the north all this time, and now suddenly in a new series. Yeah, and I certainly wouldn't want to live in Devon again. Devon, beautiful seaside place. Lots of tourists come just up from Cornwall. Um, And I... I, that's where I grew up, so that was home for me until I left home. Um, but yeah, just over five years ago, my husband died quite unexpectedly, and we'd lived in all these wonderful places and done all those wonderful things. And I and he had so many friends in the northeast in Whitley Bay, where I where we live. And I just wanted to run away for a bit, not really from the memories of Tim, but from all that sympathy and pity. If you've lost people, you'll you'll understand, I think. And so I ran away down to Devon to stay with an old school friend, my best friend who I've known since I was about 11 or 12. And she looked after me and we went for long walks and and just talking to her, she'd grown up in a very strict, enclosed evangelical community, Um, not cruel or unkind, nothing like that, but very certain, you know, that when the day of rapture came, if you believed, you would be saved, and if you didn't, you would be damned. And so very sort of, un, uh, very, uh, no compromise, very certain about the belief. And she she drifted away from that in later years, but said that if she'd stood up and at a meeting and said, I can't believe this, she would be unfellowshipped. She would be um, lost to her family and to the community. And it occurred to me that this, if this happened to somebody who'd grown up actually believing that he was special because he was a part of this community and his parents, only child of doting parents, and he lost his faith and was cast out, you would just feel so lost and so unanchored and the world would seem such a chaotic place that you might decide that you would join the police service to find that sense of duty and honour because we do call it the police service. You know, we, we don't have a force, we have a service, that police officers are there to serve our community, uh, that, you, that you might do that. And so that's how I, that's, M- Matthew was starting to, to, to churn around in my brain a bit at that point. But the, uh, and at that point, that's, that's all I had. But the people who looked after me after Tim died, who you know, scooped me up from the hospital and let me cry on their shoulder and fed me tea and wine and, and who were still looking after me five years on, who, you know, still phoning me up, we're going out for a beer if you fancy it, or what are you doing at the weekend? If you're on your own, come and see us. Or a gay couple called Martin and Paul, who are great friends of Tim's and, and of mine, and we go on holiday together and they live close by. So really, they were rattling around in my head while I was creating this character. And that's how Matthew became gay. Um, Because I wanted to celebrate my friendship with those two men, but also I wanted to celebrate the the, the relationship that they had, a wonderful marriage. Now, they they got married since. But um, so I wanted to do that. And so that's how Matthew turned out to be gay. And it also worked very well for the plot because he would... I think struggle, reconciliation with the family would be very dif- difficult if you were a gay man. So so that's how it... And people have said to me, oh, you know, did, did you... Is it because your editor told you? Did you have to put a gay... No, it's because this is somebody that I know and somebody that I want to write about who's now in my head and I can't imagine him not being gay. And I didn't do it lightly. I really didn't want to cause offence. So obviously my gay friends Martin and Paul read it and and gave me some ideas. It was then read by two other gay couples. And so um, that's how it's, that's how how Matthew arrives. And this is his third outing in The Raging Storm. This is third outing. And if you read the second book, you will recognize that the marriage between Matthew and Jonathan has the same kind of tensions and the same kind of balancing act and so forth that a marriage between, you know, two people of opposite sex or whatever uh, would would have. You know, marriage is a marriage where you have to try to, yeah. you know, compromise and negotiate with a partner. I, um, think, I think so. And I, and obviously it's, 
it's not easy. You don't want to appropriate another person's feelings. Or, But I write about kids and I write about men and I think it's okay for me to write about a gay couple as well. And that's what I've done. And I, it's the only happy marriage I've ever written about and I love writing it. So. <laughs> Excellent point. Yeah. Oh, right. So there's a really interesting dedication to this book, Anne. Would you tell us who it's dedicated to and the reason yeah. why? Yeah, it's dedicated to the RNLI, which is the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, which in the UK is a voluntary organization. So the crews who man the lifeboats are all volunteers. The people who raise the funds are all volunteers. The the lifeboat operations managers who, who organize the call-outs are volunteers, and they're incredibly skillful sea people, uh, men and women who who do it. And it's it was important to me because when we lived on Hilbury, this tiny island when we were first married, um, Tim was pretty reckless. He wasn't the most sensible person, and he borrowed a little boat and went out to ring some birds on a on a on a, a rock just as the tide was coming in. The boat wasn't terribly seaworthy and capsized. And although they were very close to the land, he was with a, another friend, at least he had a life jacket on, they were swept out to the Irish Sea. I wasn't there, I was at work, I was working at this point. Um, but really, luck, I'm just a whole series of lucky incidents. There was somebody on the island um, who'd walked on earlier before the tide, and he'd been a, a he was a former merchant seaman, a birder. And he saw what happened and he knew what to do. So he went into our house. He phoned the Coast Guard who got the who got in touch with the inshore lifeboat. They were on exercise already. So they were already launched and, and, and were able to head out to to get him to rescue them. Uh, then Alan, the, the guy on the island, broke into the Coast Guard lookout because Tim and I were both worked as auxiliary Coast Guards and found a flare and fired it so accurately that Tim can remember the bits of flame falling around him because the inshore lifeboats are really low in the water and it was quite there was quite a sea so it was difficult for them to f to see the guys and and manage to pick them up and get them back but just in time I mean really really just in time um, I think David the guy that Tim was with had actually lost consciousness it was very cold so yeah so I was I was uh, I trained to be a probation officer by this point, and I was um, in court and got a phone call to say you better get to Clatterbridge Hospital, which was the nearest. And there they were wrapped in in space blankets to try and get the the temperature back up. Yeah, and had to have a night in hospital, and then they were fine. But that's why I'm very grateful to the RNLI. And this book starts off with a with a lifeboat call out, um, and I did some research locally. In, in the northeast, well, our nearest lifeboat station is in Colourcoats. I went and chatted to the wonderful young woman who's a helm, so is in charge of the boat, who steers the boat. And they have a whole female crew now in Colourcoats as well as the men. And um, yeah, so that's how it came about. The North Devon coast is a tricky place. We're in a seaside village where this book... I'm faffing around because the truth is there's not very much we can talk about about this book without infinite spoilers and an extremely complicated plot. Yeah. And almost anything we say is going to give stuff away. I could, I could talk about how it starts. Should I do that? Yeah, it starts off with a local hero turning up in this village. And it's not a pretty Devon village. This is the village with a big quarry at the top of it and almost like industrial feel to it because it's got um, the quarry workers' cottages. It's not really a place where people can want to come for their holidays. They might be interested, but they probably wouldn't want to stay there because there's no real beach. It's um, shingle and rock. And, and it's... So... so this, there's a local legend called Jem Roscoe because he sailed around the world before when he was still very young and he's done television shows walking up the Amazon. <coughs> um, and, um, and he blows in one day on a storm and ends up in the local pub which is called The Maiden's Prayer. And he, everybody's so excited because you know, he's been on television and he's famous and he's 
a bit like David Attenborough blowing in. And uh, everybody wants to know what, what he's doing there. And he just thought, it's mysterious and I'm just waiting for somebody, boys. I'm just here waiting for someone. And then after a fortnight, he disappears. And that's where the story really starts. I brought extras because the same, it was so cold. And the, you know how it is in Phoenix, Mayor, how hot it is outside. You need to take a sweater if you want to go anywhere, right? Well, this hotel that we were at in Bajorcon, I swear it was like 60 degrees. And it was the, very I've, cold. I've come home with kind of a, you know, it was just freezing. Yeah, it's I, I, it's some sort of allergy, I think, because one of the one of the um, writers gave me an allergy pill and it stopped it. But I've run out, so I'm having to suck sweets now. Right. So what I thought, I think it's really interesting. Many of you, you know, if you've read about um, that part of the world, you know, Cornwall, Devon and so forth, you probably know that wreckers flourished. Right. And so I love the fact that the royal, I mean, that the lifeboat people are actually going out there to save lives instead of, you know, luring ships into shore so they will wreck and go out and plunder them. Because that was actually a kind of a, a career for it a lot was, of people. Sure. And, there yeah. was such valuable stuff on ships and, you know, when they would wreck and they could bring everything to the beach that a lot of poor families, um, it was a real bonanza for them. Yeah, and I think this is more of an adventure story for me. I don't know if you agree, Barbara, because I wanted to play on that history. So there are, the sailors are very superstitious. So there's an idea of superstition in there and not quite of buried treasure, but of... That sort of idea in there. I think it's more of an adventure story than anything I've written. No, before. I think it is too. And it's also an extremely complicated story. I mean, there are a lot of people in it with a lot of things going on among all of them. And uh, I'm not that often fooled, um, or I shouldn't say fooled, surprised. Um, but I really didn't see where this one was going. And, um, and you won't either, unless you're, well, maybe you're smarter than we are. But. Um, <laughs> Not smarter than Anne, because she always... Well, actually, that brings me to another thing, because people always want to know this. You know, how is it that you write your books? Do you come up with... Um, do you know the, the Irish entertainer Graham Norton? Yeah. All right, so I did I did his book lunch. A couple of, it was a virtual thing. Lovely man. I'd never met him before. Very and lovely. once again, I had the benefit of cheating by listening to somebody else interview him before I did. Um, and one of the questions that came up was, how did he go about writing his books? And he said that he always starts with a situation, or in your case, a landscape in a situation. And then, you know, characters appear. And, you know, they're in this situation. And the plot comes last. You know, it's the situation. And then the characters and then he figures out what they might be doing would, would that be sort of how you do things yeah absolutely it's it's kind of, I write like a reader so I'll write the first chapter and then I need to know what's going to happen next so I write the next chapter and I just keep going until till I'm about halfway through and then I have some sort of idea where I'm heading for but it's this and this is because I was 20 years without any commercial success because it had to be fun no, it was, it, this was my relaxation and it was what I did when the kids had gone to bed or, you know, when I wanted some time for me was to write. Didn't feel like work, but it had to be fun and I still want it to be fun and it still really is fun. I love it. I can I can say that this book really would be fun, but at the same time to actually bring off the fine, when, when you have him in the village and he's living in this I mean, is this a man, you know, who theoretically is, is wealthy? He's certainly famous and all the rest of it. And he's picked this just sort of godforsaken, no facilities cottage at the end of a lane. I mean, you know, why would he be there? And when he goes, hmm, I'm just waiting for somebody. You must, did you have any idea who he is waiting for? No, none at all. Which is why it's surprising when you get there. All right. But we, fi but we find out who he is waiting for at the end. No, no, no. But we don't find out until the end, and that's part of the surprise. Right. Um, we haven't talked about the TV series then. It's called The Long Call, right? Yeah. Yes, that was lovely. It's the same production team that makes um, Vera and Shetland. I think it's going to be a one-off series. I don't, I don't think they're commissioning any more. But it's definitely worth trying to track down. It's got um, some amazing actors in it. Juliet Stevenson, huge name in the UK, big 
theatre actor, um, Martin Shaw, who was Judge Deeds and many other things, um, who's very, very scary in it, actually, isn't he? He's really sc uh, And Anita Dobson, who British audiences know because she was in a soap opera called EastEnders, and she was the, the, the first landlady in that. But in this, she is stunningly good. I think she's probably that scene. Um, there's, a, there's a scene where because of, of I call them the Baron Brethren, this this religious group, and there's a sea baptism. So they're they're baptizing this this young lass in the sea. And there's a conversation between the two of them between uh, Anita Dobson, who's an older woman, who's Martin Shaw's wife, and this young lass who's being baptized. And they're talking about, and uh, Anita Dobson says something like, you know, you can talk to me, and the girl doesn't answer. Has he told you, you shouldn't talk to me? A silence. He's told me he should only talk to him and God. And so we know that there's, but it's really spine tingling the way that they do it. And actually that, I went to watch them film that. And that's where the, the setting for the village in, in the Raging Storm came from, because they did it in a village called Heartland Quay, which is gray and bleak and has granite cliffs, huge granite cliffs and this, this key and just rocks with um, cockles. So everything looking sort of pockmarked and dark and that and it was brilliant because you see these two very vulnerable women in this immense landscape with a gray sea rushing in and that's really how i got the the image of greystone the village in the raging storm from it's disappointing did covid put an end to you know going forward or who knows i don't know i think partly i think um ben aldridge who plays matthew venn who is very, very good looking. So good looking. I think got um I think he's in Hollywood doing something or was, so he got pulled out of the picture. Okay, yeah. So that's that hard. Had yeah, to do with actors it. can do that to you. They suddenly get a better gig or a different gig or something. Do y'all remember Downton Abbey and the really cheesy way that they got rid of him in season three? I mean it was awful. Right. But they, they it kept going. These things happen, I think. But you know, I I mean Already, every crime writer in the UK makes little wax models of me and sticks pins in. Because, you know, three series on television is pretty, pretty good. But on the other hand, if you've had successful television, there's no reason why they wouldn't bet on you to have more successful television yeah. as opposed to taking a chance on, you know, somebody completely unknown. Yeah, and I think that's it because most TV companies are fairly risk averse. So and Vera's done so well. It's and like Shetland's publishers, so right. Yeah, yeah, it all works out right. that way. Actually, you know, I think it's quite a tribute to you that publishers, you know, you, you've been able to do five series um, and that that's quite unusual. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky. I'm published by St. Martin's Press Minotaur here in the US and by Pan Macmillan in the UK and they're all part of the Macmillan group so it's like um, so I get editorial notes from editors but they collaborate first so I don't get two sets of notes just get one set of notes that is a very lucky thing so that is very very lucky yes and, and we talk together about what we're going to do and how it's going to work which is why I think it's um, it works very well here I think I've been very very lucky here so I have been fortunate in that Ann Cleves has a, a friend and colleague called Martin Edwards who has won another reward. I don't know where he's going to put him. He's going to have a shelf that's going to collapse. Um, and he's a, he's a remarkable guy. Um, he's a solicitor. He has a Diamond Dagger winner. He was chairman of the Crime Writers Association and he is president of the Detection Club in a long line. I've been really lucky to have been to invited to three different Oh, have meetings. you been to the Detection Club? I have, yeah. right. Well, they're great fun. Well, Peter loves me. And actually, my favorite, my favorite one um, was when everybody met at the Savoy. And um, it was a wonderful evening. And at one point, as one does, I excused myself to visit what in Britain is called the Women's Loo, in which we call the restroom for reasons that don't make any sense. But anyway, who should I encounter but P.D. James, who was sitting there. Barbara, she said, because we knew each other, she said, 
I, you know, sit down and talk to me, she said, and then we won't have to go back in <laughs> for a while. So I sat there on the pink carpet in, <laughs> in the ladies' loo in the Savoy and talked to Phyllis for maybe half an hour and all. I mean, that's one of those moments you could never script for yourself in your whole life. You Absolutely know? not, no. I can remember just thinking of the Savoy when I was first published. Um, Boucher came came to London. Do you remember Boucher? Oh, I to... went to that one. Yeah. Yes, I do. It was um, fragmented would be a kind word. It, it wasn't the best organized. But because of the exchange rate, it wasn't hard for the American publisher. I was with a different American publisher then to put on um, a good party. So um, they were all staying at the Savoy, which is a very, very grand hotel on the River Thames. So I got taken out for lunch by my editor in the Savoy. And then they held the, the, the party, the, the author's party in the Savoy too. And I would, I'd been published maybe two or three years at this point. So very new, certainly not, you know, one of the high flyers, but I got on very well with my American editor, a woman called Leona Nevler at the time. Uh, it's all right. It was the light bulb calling. <laughs> So I went along to this party, you know, fairly terrified and, and sat there and very, very grand champagne as you went in and a proper sit down dinner. And they don't do it like that anymore, do they, Barbara? It's very different now. No. And I sat there and um, I had Dick Francis on one side of me and Sue Grafton on the other. And I thought, oh, so this is what it's like being published. <laughs> it has never been like that again. Well, all right, if we're going to trade stories, let me tell you about my first encounter with British crime writing. It was in 1990, which was the Agatha Christie centenary, strangely enough, in the part of the country that you are writing about, and um, entirely unprepared. Rob and I signed up to go, and we stayed in the beautiful hotel in Torquay, and it's a whole weekend and the whole bit, and... Um, I don't know anything. So I didn't know that when they put me at a table with H.R.F. Keating and Robert Barnard, and I'm trying to remember, I'm Peter Lovesey and his wife, that I was sitting among the greats, and they were so kind. They really were welcoming and kind. And then, and then the best part was I got to dance with David Suchet. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing, wearing my Southwest dress that I did grocery shopping with in Santa Fe, because here's the thing, if you are suddenly confronted with a black tie affair, men can rent black tie clothing anywhere. Women don't get to do that. And the only long dress I had was this sort of New Mexican thing that I had brought along, you know, just for whatever. And so there I am dancing with David Suchet and thinking, I'll just die. I'm so embarrassed, but it <laughs> didn't work out. But I do think that in general, and it's true in the American community, too, but the British crime writer people and the Texan Club people, all you British authors, are amazingly kind and welcoming. I think so. I think so because we don't take ourselves too seriously. Some literary authors can take themselves a bit seriously. And if you go to a literary literature festival, sometimes, you know, the, the, the authors, we're all in the green room being looked very, very well looked after. And the, the readers are all out there waiting for us to appear. Whereas the, our big crime writing festival in the UK is, is at Harrogate. And there, nobody is ever in the green room. They're in the bar with all the readers. You know, it's much more, much more, yeah, much more friendly. It's a lovely thing. It's in July. So if any of you are ever interested in going, it's usually the middle of July. And then St. Hilda's College at Oxford does a really lovely crime writers yeah. weekend in August. And then Bloody Scotland, if you happen to go that way, is usually in mid-September, if yeah. I have that right. Yes, it is. So it's a, you know, it's just a constant round of gaiety in the UK. So I think we might have reached the point for questions. So Absolutely. who would like to ask one? Anne, why don't you take over and call on people? Uh, the person who's nearest to me and then the person in the hat who's furthest away from me. Yeah. So the the question is, how does the research happen? Do I do it beforehand, or do I as I I'm going through? Um, I make stuff up. 
I write fiction. So the one, the wonderful John Mortimer, who wrote the um, the Rumpole series, said that it gave a wonderful tip, which was write the story first and do the research later. Because otherwise you get so fixated on the, the research that you put great chunks of stuff in that weigh it down. Um, I had worked in the criminal justice system. I'd worked as a probation officer. So I had a bit of understanding about how that worked. But since then, I've got three really good friends who I call on um, when I need some information. The first one is a woman called Helen Pepper, who was a senior crime scene manager and who now teaches on the policing course at one of our Northeastern u universities. So she teaches police officers because they now do a university training before they they let loose on the world. Um, and then the, the second person that I work with very closely is a forensic soil scientist, Professor Lorna da uh, Dawson, who um, who is just amazing. Um, once we, we set her a challenge and um, a, a reporter went up to the Scottish Highlands, came back with, with a boot that had a bit of mud on the bottom, scraped it off, and she was able to tell him after analysing that soil within a square kilometre where he'd been. So, and she's actually solved a number of very important cases by by finding out, you know, I think soil on a spade that had been used to dig a grave, and so they could actually um, find the murderer that way. So it's quite a number of old cases she's dealt with. And then my third and probably fam favourite friend is a guy called uh, James Grieve, Professor James Grieve, who um, was the, uh, still is, I think, because they keep pulling him back. He keeps trying to retire and they keep having him back, who was forensic pathologist based in, uh, Aberdeen. So if there were an unexplained death, he would go to Shetland to, um, to, to, and would do the post-mortem. And he appears as himself in the Shetland books as a, a bit of fun. But he's great for the, the Heron's Cry, the second of the, of the Matthew Venn books. I, I was using this metaphor of blowing glass in that book, because it seemed to me that if you blow glass, when it's warm, it's really pliable and it'll take whatever shape you want. But then when it's cold, it's brittle and it'll snap suddenly. And I think there are people like that who appear very pliable and biddable and they'll be whoever you want them to be. But actually, when they're cold, they just snap and become quite violent. And so that, so I wanted to know if a bit of hand-blown glass could kill somebody. I phoned him up. James, I've got this idea. What do you think? Anne, do you know how many glassings in Glasgow bars I've, how many victims I've had on the table? Of course it would. <laughs> so, so that's, he's just very, very useful. And in this book, there's a bit about um, childhood disease and his wife is a pediatrician and Nicola helped me a lot with, with that too. So, um, yeah, I, but I, I get the story first. Yes. So the question is, what involvement do I have with the TV series? And the answer is that when I first met them, I insisted, when I first signed the contract for the books, uh, for the, the adaptations, I insisted that the writers go to the places where the books are set, because again, place matters. And I thought, if you've actually never been to Shetland, how could you possibly understand it? If you've never been to North Devon, you, you can't do that. And I insisted that they were filmed where the places were set because it's much cheaper to film on the mainland than to take all your kit up to Shetland, all the filming kit up to Shetland. And to, to put actors and crew up there is expensive. But I think it was worth doing. And I think the team believed it was worth doing. So I had that kind of involvement. Beyond that, I didn't want it. I, I don't know what makes good television. I trusted the people that I'd met within the company. They're called Silver Print Pictures. So I got to know the execs and I'd met the writers and I, and I really trusted that, they read, that they'd read the books. They 
got the character and they got a sort of ethos about the, the books because I think at the heart of the books there's a kind of kindness and I think they understood that and that is there in all the TV shows um, but after that let them get on with it I'm hoping that that the directors and the team have a very clear vision about what they want to achieve and if I'm there every five minutes saying oh I'm not sure Vera would do that or no no you can't you, that's not that's not how I describe them in the book, then that muddies their vision and we would end up with a, a less successful piece of television. So you've actually let the Shetland series go in the sense that you've stopped writing it, but yeah. they're carrying on. I remember you told me that a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm very happy for them to do that. They have good writers. I get invited because I don't interfere. We get on very well. Yeah. And uh, I am not, but I've learned so much by osmosis just by tagging along. I'm surprised that you put so many bird references in your book. Why is that? I think the, the question is, why are there so many bird references in the book when I'm not a birder? Um, I think like you, it seeps in by osmosis. And because it's it was so such an important part of our life, you know, all our holidays were... And you go to such brilliant places that I never really regretted it or got cross about it, resented it. But I think it's in, in the, the Vera books, it's because Hector is still, Hector is Vera's father. He was um, the second son of a sort of minor aristocracy, the black sheep, and ended up making a living by trading in rare bird's eggs, stealing raptors from the wild dodgy kind of taxidermy, that sort of stuff, that he's such a big part of the books and he was a really neglectful father. So Vera is haunted by him. That I think that that's why the birds creep in because she has these memories of being dragged out as a child to, to look out while he was climbing cliffs to steal eggs or to steal young, young birds. Yeah, uh, you first, yeah. No, they weren't. They weren't. I mean, I think they would obviously have been quite happy if I'd wanted to continue writing them. But there are twenty-one thousand people in the whole of Shetland. You know, I'd written eight books. I'd killed off a fair few people. <laughs> and I, I think they understood, as I understood, that if you're starting to get bored, the reader will start to get bored. And there are only so many stories that can come out of that community for me. And so you don't want to push it. And it was time for it to stop. Yeah. As opposed to Vera, because Newcastle and all of that is a really big area. That's right. And there are d these different settings and different places where I can set stories. Shetland, you know, there are lots of islands, but they're pre they're, there are sheep everywhere. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry. The question is, do I see Brenda Blethyn while I'm writing Vera? <laughs> I don't so much see her, but I can hear her voice when I'm writing dialogue. And sometimes I'll write a bit of dialogue and I think, oh, I do hope the script writers keep that in because Bren's going to love saying that. <laughs> so there is that. And it's she is such an amazing person to have play our characters because she reads and reads and reads. So we always send her a proof copy. She reads that she always talks about going back to the source material. You know, this is a double Oscar nominee. And she worked with the director, Mike Lee, on Little, Little Voice and Secrets and Lies. And his way of working with an actor is that they do create this person who's very different from themselves, but they research them and they know them. And her way of doing that is, she says, by going back to the source material. So she, she does go back to, to the books every time. And I think she's so close now to the Vera of the books. 
she's it's like having a representative on set so i don't i really don't need to interfere because i'll go and she'll if there's a new script writer and he's writing something out of character for our vera it goes back and it has to be rewritten <laughs> so you know i d i don't need to vet the scripts cuz brenda's there doing it for me <laughs> yeah yeah sorry i'll come to you now um geordie is what we call anybody who lives in newcastle so it's like Cockneys live in London, Geordies live in, Geordies live in, in Newcastle. And the, David Leon is a true Geordie, so Joe Ashworth's accent was spot on. Yeah. Yes. Well, you see, that was down to television script writers. I'm not sure that Vera has had a romantic past. I think she has always been very self-contained. She grew out, I think, if we're talking, you know, go go back to where she actually came from when she burst through that door. I was born in the mid-50s, so not that long after the war. And there were women in the small community where I grew up who had had really important roles during the war because when the men went off to fight, the women ran offices and they worked farms and they worked machinery and they... They ran local councils because there were no men there to do it. And then the men came back and they were expected to relinquish that. 1950s, they were, if you're a teacher and you got married, you were expected to give up your job because there were men coming back who needed the work. And I think there, things have changed. Thank goodness things have changed. But um, I think there were quite a few formidable spinsters in my little town who were hospital matrons, infant school head teachers, worked in libraries, worked in worked as civil servants, who had decided they would rather be single than 1950s housewives. And I think Vera is very much grew out of those women. And that's not just a British phenomenon that happened here in the United States. The Rosie the Riveter people was the same thing. If any of you watched a program called Bletchley, um, it was about some women who had been, um, you know, crucial in um, the war effort at Bletchley Park. And then, A, they couldn't talk about it because they'd signed the Official Secrets Act, and B, they were expected to just revert to their pre-war role. Yeah which was a pretext for them sleuthing. So is there one more question before? Yes. Well, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, do. <laughs> I can, that one I can answer with certainty this time next year. I'm not sure I'll be back in the States next year. I've been twice this year and I do have to travel a lot, but um, if I'm not back, but Vera will certainly be here. So there, Vera and, and the new book will be here. And I can't so tell you the title. I brought yet, up but. Martin Edwards for a reason and got sidetracked into the Detection Club and, you know, glorious yeah. memories of David Suchet. But in point of fact, Anne and Martin Edwards, whom I mentioned, have very kindly, we have Zoomed together on several occasions, either for a Martin book or for an Anne book. So if she's not here, hopefully she will agree to, um, to do another thing no, with certainly. Martin. Yeah, um, and you can you can find them. We're actually working on a on an index to all of the um, videos and the podcasts because there's so many of them now that you can't really just cycle through it like you used to. There are almost two hundred and fifty thousand podcast downloads wow. at this point, proving um, it was a great idea. It's only three years too. Think about that. I know it's amazing. So we've reached the part where I would like to thank all of you for coming by giving away a book. And Anne, if you could. It's the one underneath. It's the orange book. The orange book. And this is a book oh, published yeah. by great, Anne's great publisher called Golden Gate. Um, for, and as it happens, Anne's publicist, who is here, is the publicist. Hi, Sarah. The publicist for this wonderful book. I can't even begin to describe it. There's so many elements in it. It's a beautiful book. San Francisco, Bay Area history, um, other communities, really, and generations, family trauma, and you'll... At the end, you're just going, really? Um, the solution to it is so remarkable. So I need somebody, John. Thank you. Um, if you look in your book, you should have a number. And um, 
we have 49 of them. So, Anne, it is your job to pick a number between 1 and 49. I'm going to pick number 24. Aha. All right. See me. Um, <laughs> and I will give you a copy of Golden Gate. Our autograph copies are on their way in, and it's our first mystery book of the month. Uh, for September. It's just a remarkable book. She wrote something. What, what's the original? The Tiger Moms or something? Um, the Battle Hymn of the Tiger Moms. Right. right. Anyway, Tiger Mothers or Tiger Moms is her other book that she wrote. So this is the tricky part, everybody. Today is basically a Barbie Heimer event, a matinee, because you're here for Ann's book lunch, and at 4 o'clock we have a book lunch for Craig Johnson. So we can't pick up all the chairs, and it's also what we're going to do is ask you to go to our new upstairs room, and you can line up. Um, some of you should stay here because it's hot to stand outside on the balcony. Um, Sarah and Ann and I will go up there, and Ann is going to sign the books and chat with you up there. Um, if you're staying for Craig, you could just put something in your seat to mark your seat so you don't have to give it up. And if you're not, thank you very much for coming. Let's give Anne a huge round of applause. <laughs> it's lovely to see you in person. Right. So if you'll, uh, yes, um, oops, sorry, turned it off. Yes, it would be better.